Steyo. The Nadmi. The Breitha Chadatha. The Hiblakom Wachrabim. The Mashlech Chataim. What do the Nala the Kani? I 
It's your victory, Jesus, you are enough. You did it for me, you did it for love. It's your victory, Jesus, you are enough. You did it for me, you did it for love. It's your victory, Jesus, you are enough. You did it for me, you did it for love, it's your victory, Jesus, you are enough. Because of your cross, my debt is paid, because of your blood, my sins are washed away. Because of your love, because of your cross, my debt is paid. Because of your blood, my sins are washed away. Now all of my life I freely give. Because of your love, because of your love I live. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, precious Father. Father, we just pray that you have your way, Lord. Just know that these altars are always open. Don't ever hold back. Shake off these heavy 
change Wipe away every day I'm not who I used to be Because I don't have to be The old man inside of me Cause his day is long dead and gone Because I've got a new name A new life I'm not the same And I hope that I'll bury me home I'm So I'll shake off these heavy chains Wipe away every stain I'm not who I used to be Wipe away every stain I'm not who I used to be Oh God, I'm not who I used to be No, I'm not who I used to be I'm redeemed Thank you, Lord Thank you, precious Father. Hallelujah. Isaiah 53. Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant. And like a root out of dry ground, he had no form or majesty that we should look at him. And no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. As one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. And upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed. He was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter. And like a sheep that before its shears is silent. So he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And as for this generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people, and they made his grave with the wicked and with the rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth, yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong. Because he has poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors, yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. Isaiah 53. 
I want to welcome you to our service here for Good Friday here at House of Rest Church. This is something that we do every single year. And in essence, I've realized that a lot of times we don't really, it doesn't hit the same because we constantly hear that he died for us. And sometimes we become immune to that. And so what we want to do tonight for you is we want to take you back 2,000 years because we call it Good Friday, but it wasn't so good that first Friday. And what I want to do is have a service that takes us out of Modesto, out of 2024, and somehow transports us to the city of Jerusalem on that very night, on that very evening, when our Savior died a horrible death on the cross. So now that you're here, the funeral of Jesus begins. I want to pray. Lord God, I thank you. I thank you for each and every person that is here. I thank you for those that are watching. I especially thank you for those that have not yet surrendered their life to you because if you are sitting here or watching and you have not surrendered your life yet, this night is for you. This night is about the souls that will be reached for your kingdom, Lord. You are the senior pastor of this church and this pulpit will always belong to you. We thank you in Jesus' name, amen. So we've moved back 2,000 years, and this is what his eulogy would be like. Jesus passed today from this life. All of us are friends and family, followers of him. We all know what happened a few hours ago. Surviving is his mother Mary. He was raised by his stepfather Joseph, who loved him very, very much, also his siblings. He was born in Bethlehem and raised in the small town of Nazareth. I want to thank all of the family and friends, you, that loved him. His smile, his kind eyes, his unapologetic way of teaching that stirred our hearts every time that he spoke. The, the way he would look into your soul each time he talked to you, it was as if nobody else existed, just you. He could be preaching to thousands, but many times I felt like it was just me. And I will miss him so much. We will miss him so, so much. I'm going to ask my wife to sing because we both follow Jesus every day. And she wanted to sing a song to our Lord. Papa, kulet kehu, enka hel, kaste ge de mini, a kein lakis fa, le hoe di lakis fa. Thank <laughs> you. 
In Jerusalem that day The soldiers tried to clear the narrow street But the crowd pressed in to see A man condemned to die on Calvary He was bleeding from a beating there were stripes upon his back And he wore a crown of thorns upon his head And he bore with every step The scorn of those who cried out for his death Down the Via Dolorosa Called the way of suffering Down the Via Dolorosa All the way To Calvary Por la Via Dolorosa Triste día en Jerusalén Los soldados le abren paso a Jesús Mala gente se acercaba para ver al quien llevaba aquella cruz. Por la vía dolorosa es la vía del dolor. Como veja vino Cristo, Rey Señor, y fue él quien quiso huir por su amor. Por la vía dolorosa al calva yo ya morí. The blood not worthless, the souls of all men made its way to the heart of Jerusalem.
I know there's many family and friends of the Lord. We all saw what just happened. But there's a few that I would like for them to share their heart. And I know many of us, the thousands that loved him and adored him, it would take weeks for all of us to speak. It was somebody very close to the Lord. It was a family. A man named Lazarus. And he had two sisters, Mary and Martha. And Mary, the sister of Martha, would like to come and share a few words. Are you here? Thank you. Hello, my name is Mary, sister of Lazarus. I am a friend of the family and a follower of Jesus. I do not know where to begin, so I decided to write these words down instead. I feel so lost and helpless when I saw him on the cross earlier today. I feel like a part of me died. I don't understand why. He was so good to everyone. He was so good to me and my family. Most of all, he was good to my brother Lazarus, who was dead until Jesus showed up. When I learned about Jesus, I knew he was special. When I knew he was in town, I wanted to show him how much he meant to me. I don't think others understand what I quickly understood early on, and that is that he was the king. He was the Messiah. He was the anointed one. I just had to see him and nothing was going to stop me but I knew I couldn't come into a pr come into the presence of the king without a gift so I grabbed the most precious thing I owned my alabaster box of oil it has been passed down the generations of my family when I approached the house he was in and I began to weep I couldn't help it my heart was pounding what if he would reject me? I didn't want to disturb him as he sat and he ate with the other men. So I knelt down and began to wash his feet with my tears. At that point, I didn't care who was looking. I broke the alabaster box of oil and poured it on his beautiful feet. Then I realized I had no towel to dry them, so I wiped his feet with my hair. Some of the men that were with me him began to say mean things about me and for the first time someone stood up for me Jesus didn't reject me he didn't judge me he looked at me with a look I have never seen and he said the most precious words ever spoken to me he said your sins are forgiven I am hurt today and he did not deserve what happened to him. But somehow I feel like we all deserved it. Yet he loved us so much that he'd rather have suffered than any of us suffer. I will miss him, but I have a feeling that it's not over. Thank you, Mary. There's another brother that I feel that his testimony needs to be shared. His name is Jarius. And as many of you know, he was a synagogue leader. Jarius, are you here? If you could just share your heart, brother. Thank you. So I'm not very good at expressing, so I did a 
a note. More than a note. Hello, my name is Jarez. To begin, I need to share this. When I heard of Jesus, I didn't like him very much. His stories made me nervous. I was a religious leader in my town. Everyone looked to me for answers. And I liked the attention. I kept hearing about Jesus walking in the towns and turning the world upside down. Suppose that Jesus was healing people and casting out demons. What kind of circus was it Jesus doing? I wasn't going to let this happen in my town. I'm a simple man. I love my wife. I love my daughter. They're the center of my world. I know I'm going on and on. But so much happened when Jesus came into my town. I had told the other elders that if Jesus ever dared to come into my town, I would kick him out. He wasn't going to mess up what we had going. And a few days later, Jesus came into town. I still remember. It was a quiet morning when I heard my daughter complaining about her body hurting. She looked sick and weak and as the day continued, she wouldn't even eat and she became feverish. My wife and I, we went to the doctor, but there was nothing they could find. I became so worried. I prayed to God for her and wouldn't leave her side. Each day that passed was worse than the last. The elders continued to tell me that Jesus was getting closer and that I had to do something. I begged, but each moment she just got worse. Finally, the next morning I was startled by the, the elders. I must have fallen asleep. Instantly I looked at my baby girl. I thought she was dead. She didn't move. I got closer to her and could barely hear her breathing. I became frantic. The elders that started me were talking to me, but I couldn't even hear them. I was worried. I was afraid. Finally, I focused on one name they mentioned. They said, Jesus is coming into town, and you need to do something about it. I ran out of my house as fast as I could. The elders must have followed behind. I needed to find this Jesus. I didn't care what the elders thought. I needed Jesus to heal my baby. When I found him, there were thousands of people around him. I didn't care. I did not care. I pushed my way through. When I finally got to him, I saw his eyes. Eyes like I never seen before. Instantly, I could no longer hold it, and I cried. I sobbed, I begged for him to please heal her. Please, Jesus, come to my house. My daughter is dying. If you lay your hands on her, I know she will live. I couldn't believe it. He nodded and he asked me to show him the way to the house. I was excited. The crowd wasn't letting us walk as fast as I wanted to. 
We needed to hurry. My baby was dying. Finally, we arrived to my home. My worst nightmare became my reality. I knew as soon as I saw the faces of my family and friends, they said, your daughter's dead. My heart sank. My life shattered into a thousand pieces. My soul felt like it withered. But Jesus came next to me. And he said these words to me, Jairus, don't be afraid. Just believe. Some laughed at him. Jesus didn't care. He walked up to my daughter's bed and now and that down next to her. My wife and I were in a complete shock. I wasn't able to say anything as I watched. Jesus simply said some words to her, so gentle, so quiet. As if speaking to a newborn child, he said, little girl, wake up. And right before my eyes, I saw breath come into her lungs and her eyes open. She sat right up. Not only was she alive, but this is why I'm here. In that moment, I knew Jesus was the Messiah. My family and I have followed Jesus ever since that day. He is my King. He is my Lord. And He is my God. My daughter wants to say a couple of little things as well. Hello, I am really sad today. I just want to share with you about who Jesus is for me. I remember feeling sick, I couldn't move. I was so weak. I remember hearing my mom and dad crying and holding my hand. They never left me alone. I was I was scared, I didn't want to die. But I got worse and worse, then everything went blank. I knew that I had died, but I didn't, I don't know how, but I knew it. Then out of nowhere, I heard a voice, a beautiful voice. I still remember his words, little girl, wake up. And suddenly my eyes, eyes open, I, I didn't feel sick anymore, anymore, and I saw the man staring at me with so much love. He smiled at me. I didn't know him, but I loved him. His name is Jesus. He gave my life back. I will never forget him for as long as I live. Someday when I'm older, I am going to tell the whole world about Jesus. I'm so sorry to be here for this day. I still don't understand why they killed him. He was so good to me and my family. He didn't deserve to die. But he healed so many. And now, he's gone. But we're going to forget about him. Someday, this, cru this crucifixion will all make sense. Thank you. Amen. At times like this, it's good to hear the stories of our Lord. There's a brother that, um, he was so insistent in wanting to talk. My good friend Bartimaeus, are you here, brother? Can you, can you please come and share your heart with all those that are here that love Jesus? on this horrible day. Hello, I'm nervous. So I have a friend write this down for me. My name is Bartimaeus. 
thank you so much for giving me a chance to express myself on this night. I'm I'm in shock for what had happened to Jesus. If it wasn't for him, I wouldn't be here in this place tonight. When I met him, I was homeless in the city of Jericho. I am a little ashamed to say that to say this, but I would beg for money on the side of the road. But I couldn't help it. I needed to eat, and I was completely blind. I just accepted the fact that I would never be able to work and make a living. So many times I would eat the leftovers that were thrown to me. Some days I wouldn't eat at all. There was one thing I was good at, though. I was hearing what, had, what the people talked about as they would w- walk past me. Even when they whispered, I could hear them say, say things about a man named Jesus. Over every day, I would hear of this that spoke great things. Then I, then I thought I heard wrong. I heard that he was helping people, deaf people, paralyzed people, blind people. No way. I must have heard wrong. And there, and there more I heard of him, I could already see what others couldn't. I might even be blind. <coughs> I might have been blind, but my heart could see clearly. This Jesus was the one, the one we're waiting for, the descendant of King David that would come to reign forever. He was the Messiah. I fell in love with him, yet had never even heard of his voice. I still remember the day like like it was yesterday. I woke up that day and sat in my regular spot by the side of the road, hoping to get enough change to eat for the day. Then I heard a loud crowd. I thought it was a riot at first. I was afraid. Then I began to hear people. Jesus was coming. Jesus was coming. My heart pounded. So many people, if it just could get his, uh, if I could just get his attention. But the people were so loud. This was my chance to hear his voice. This would probably be my only chance. I didn't care what people thought. I began to yell for him the loudest I could. Son of David, have mercy on me. Son of David, have mercy on me. People around me began telling me to stop, be quiet. I didn't care what they wanted me to do. I need to hear his voice. And right when I began to lose hope, I heard his voice. He heard me and called me. A beggar. All those people around him, and he heard me. I quickly got up and made my way to him. The crowd got quiet for a moment. It felt like I was alone with him. And he, had, and he said those words I will never forget. What do you want me to do for you? I barely whispered the words. Teacher, I want to see. With that, he simply said, go, your faith has healed you. And just like that, the lights turned on. My eyes were open and I, could. I have never left his side since that day. I do not. I do not know why he's dead now. I don't understand why he was killed. But I do know this. I'm still his follower. If he healed me, he can heal anyone. Amen. Thank you, Bartimaeus. I know that we can't continue this night without the mother of Jesus, Mary. Are you here? If she could share.
Good evening. My name is Mary. I'm the mother of Jesus. It's been years. I'm old now. It's been a long time. And the reason why you're here tonight is because of my son. That's why you're all sitting here. Most of you loved my son. Now that I'm old, I can't remember everything, but I remember the important things. I remember I was washing dishes, and all of a sudden an angel appeared. His name was Gabriel. It frightened me so bad. But after he began to talk to me and tell me that I was favored by God, that I was special in God's eyes, I began to calm down. Because I wanted God's will in my life. I wanted to please God in everything that I did. And this is what the angel was telling me. God has chosen you, that you're going to be impregnated by the Holy Spirit to bring forth the Savior of the world, God's Son. And I wanted to please God. I didn't understand. I didn't understand. How can it be? How can this take place in life? How can I carry a child without being with a man? All things are possible with God. All things are possible with everything. And so after I calmed down, I went and got my things together, and I rushed over to Elizabeth's house, my cousin. She was pregnant also. She was six months pregnant with John the Baptist. And as soon as I ran into the house, she said, oh, Mary, my baby just jumped. She was filled with the Holy Spirit. John knew. John knew that she was carrying the Savior, and he was going to prepare the way for Jesus. Hallelujah. <laughs> Glory to God. I remember... We had a rough time together, Joseph and I. I didn't know if Joseph was going to leave me because he thought maybe I was with another man. It was hard for him to believe it too. But Gabriel had went and talked to Joseph and convinced Joseph. And Joseph took me as his bride. He took me because he wanted God's will too. And then from then on, we traveled until I could, I had the baby in a manger. We didn't have much as we traveled compared to some of us today that are blessed beyond measure, and yet we complain. I had my baby in a manger with no blankets on a bale of hay. And then beside all that, Herod, when he found out, I know I'm skipping some things because now that I'm old, I can't remember everything, but I do remember Herod. He got very angry because he had heard there was a king, a little baby that was called the king. And he knew that he was the king. So he put out a message that all the babies from two down to be killed and murdered, hoping that Jesus would be one of those babies. So Joseph and I rushed. I was on the donkey. Joseph was walking most of the way. But we ran off to Egypt, and we stayed there until Herod died. Then we made our way back. And I remember 
as Jesus grew up, I don't want to take too much time, as he grew up and we went, I believe it was to Bethlehem for the Passover, which was very important to our family and to our friends, the Passover. Do you all recognize what the Passover is? When we put the blood on the doorpost that the death angel would pass by. It was very important for us to go to these functions, to pass over and enjoy ourselves, eat and have fun. And so we stayed there three or four days. And on our way back, uh, we noticed in the caravan that we couldn't find our son Jesus. We couldn't find him. And he had disappeared maybe for a couple of days. We were worried. What could have happened to him? And then we went back to Jerusalem. And we found him in the temple with the Pharisees and the scribes teaching one another. And they were amazed at him that he understood. He understood everything. And he, he answered their questions. He had much wisdom and knowledge. And mom and dad me and Joseph, were so surprised, very proud of our son. I spent many days with my son, just him and I, and many times I felt that I was in classroom because he would teach me so much about love, about God, God's laws. I loved God's ways and his laws. I, stu I still do today. I live by God's ways and his laws. I still remember, even though it's been so long, I still remember all the days we spent together. And then things started getting worse and worse. Things started getting bad. People started not liking my son. Even though he was healing people, he was feeding the homeless, he was giving them answers that they needed to hear about their troubles, having faith in God, believing in him. Things were starting to get rough. And I began to worry about my son going from town to town, walking, evangelizing all through the country, all over. And then the news came that, the news came to me that he was arrested. And so I ran. I ran, and they were taking him into Pontius Pilate, I believe, into the court. They were having court there. And there were what there were another criminal they were going to let loose, or they were going to crucify my son. Which one? My son was innocent. He hadn't did anything wrong. He loved everyone. He was the savior of the world. But they didn't know it. They didn't believe it. I followed him everywhere. I followed him as they arrested him. I followed him into the courthouse. And as they tied him and began to beat, began to beat him in the face and pull his beard and pull his hair and whipped him 39 times on the back, just laid his back open. I was there watching everything. I was my, watching my son be tortured. He didn't deserve it at all. He wasn't the one. He wasn't the one to be crucified and beaten and hurt. They let the other one go. Then they begin. I begin to hear, crucify him. Crucify him. It's like the whole world hated on my son, hated Jesus. And he was the innocent one. He was innocent. I, I buried him. I, I, I buried my son. 
And I was also there at his death. I followed him from the court all the way to Calvary. I walked along as they beat him and as he struggled carrying the cross. I could see him look into the corner of his eyes as he seen Mama, as he seen me following, as he seen me following my son. And they took him and they put him. Always feel, always feel comfortable around cross. And I, I knelt down and watched him. I watched him being crucified. And I said, crucify me, take me, not my son. I watched him be, be bled, nail, nails, big nails in his hands. And why? And why? For you, for me, I watched him die, but he died as my savior. He died as your savior. And I love Jesus with all my heart, and I just want to thank you all for coming out tonight. Thank you so much. Thank you. We have um, a slideshow we want to show you of the Lord. I know we're taking creative license because there was no cameras at that time, but let's pretend there was. And Sharon is going to share a song as we see some of the high points of our Lord.
Imagine watching the earth and you see the only light in the midst of wickedness and darkness now crucified to a cross. And the enemy's like, oh, I'm going to extinguish you once and for all. And something amazing happened. As he's suffering on the cross, all of the darkness of the earth started to pile onto him. As the minutes went by, as the seconds went by, all of that darkness started to pile on him and pile on him and pile on him and pile on him, and it slowly diminished that light, and that little light was covered in darkness. Matter of fact, the Bible says that at 3 o'clock, Every year when they would sacrifice a sacrificial lamb in the temple, it was always right at three. And it was right at three when the Lord said, it is finished. I love the fact that Jesus says, you don't take my life. He says, I take my own life and I will raise my life back up again. He said, destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. You know what all that gunk that went on that light and distinguished that light? You know what it was? All the stuff you and I have done. All the sins of the world, past, present, and future. You and I added to that light being extinguished. He was innocent. He was perfect. There was nothing but good in him. He came to be a lamb that was slaughtered. You know, the Bible says by his stripes we are healed. Why did he have to be whipped? The Bible doesn't say that, that, that being whipped gives us salvation. It says him dying on a cross gives us salvation. So why was he whipped? Lord, why did you have to go through that for? Why did you just get straight to the cross? Why did you have to go through this? See, if we all believe that if he died on the cross for our salvation, that doesn't mean everyone's going to get saved, right? Now, just because somebody doesn't get saved, does that, does that take away what he did on the cross? No, it doesn't. Because we all have free will. So if that is true in the same way that it's the one that believes that he died on the cross for you, you will be saved, but it doesn't take it away. Nevertheless, he died on the cross and suffered on the cross. So in the same way, when he went on the whipping post, Isaiah 53 says, by his stripes, you are healed, past tense. So if you can receive a salvation in faith, why can't you receive your healing in faith? Yeah. Guys, the whole world is lost. And we once again need to cry out to the Lord again. In Jeremiah 33, 3, 33, 3, it says, Cry unto me, call unto me, and I will show you great and mighty things you never even imagined. You know, I, I know that, you know, doing services like this, not everything runs perfect. But I pray that you get the gist of what it is that we're saying. Because if you have not yet surrendered your life to the Lord, this is why we're here for you. We do this every single year because we are praying and hoping that somebody comes and hears the hope and no longer wants to live in darkness and wants to accept what the innocent died for. He died for you. That some of that gunk that came onto him was you and you're just like, Lord, thank you. Thank you for everything that you took because the Bible says that your sins were nailed to the cross. That's why we do what we do. That's why we serve him the way we serve him. That's why we shout the way we shout. That's why we praise the way we praise. That is why we do it. Yes, Good Friday wasn't so good that first Friday, but Sunday's coming. Sunday is coming. 
Sunday is coming. Sunday is coming. And death cannot hold him down. Satan couldn't hold him down. The enemy couldn't distinguish him. There was nothing the enemy can do. Jesus Christ says, destroy this temple. And I will raise it up in day three. And all the world will see who the Lord is and who the King of the King. This is the God I serve. Okay, Amy. You had your fun for a few days. But Sunday's coming. Sunday is coming. If anyone here, let's, let's stand for a minute. If there is anyone here that you have not surrendered your life to the Lord, let me present something to you that's amazing. If you haven't presented and said, Lord, I surrender my life, you know what would be awesome? I'm just, 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 it's to say, I gave my life to the Lord on Good Friday. <laughs> Imagine that testimony. On the very day that he died for me, I gave my life to him that day because he gave his life for me and I give my life to him. What a beautiful testimony. See, I got saved February 25th, 2004, and that was a beautiful day for me. <laughs> Amen. But to be able to say, I surrender, Lord, on Good Friday. If anyone is here, because we want to have communion, we're going to have communion. But the Bible says that we got to do it with a clear conscience and a clear heart. And I don't, I don't want to have communion then ask you to come to the Lord because I don't want you to miss out on this beautiful thing. See, here's what Jesus did right before he was arrested. Is he says, do this in remembrance of me. So if there's anyone here, if you would like to give your life to the Lord, this is the time, this is the moment. I'm not going to ask you to come up here. I'm not going to put the spotlight in your face. Because you, between you and God, you want to come up here, come up here as a, as a, as a stand of faith. But if you don't, that's all right. You don't have to. I understand. They're shy people. I get it. But some of you say, you know what? I want to make that proclamation in front of everyone. Because I want him to be my Lord and my Savior. Amen. Anyone else? Anyone else? Guys, this is the this is the, those of you that are that are believers. This is why you're here. This is why you're here. Don't get it twisted. Don't get it mixed up. This is about the lost. This is about somebody, somebody getting new life today. This is what this is about. There's no other reason. It is about Jesus and Jesus alone. And he says that all of heaven is about to rejoice. If that is you, whether you're here, whether you're in your seat, whether you're watching online, I want you to repeat after me. Uh, there's no specific prayer, you know, because the Bible says that you confess with your mouth and believe your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord, you shall be saved. But here's the thing, though, is I can guide you. I can guide you. And repeat after me. And say, Lord God, Lord God, I repent of all my sins. I thank you for dying on the cross for me. And after three days, I believe you rose again. I love you, Lord. I worship you, God. Teach me. Lead me and guide me. Take out my heart of stone and put in a heart of flesh. Put your spirit upon me. Let me love what you love and hate what you hate. On this good Friday, I come alive in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Let's give the Lord a hand. Or depression.
depression or thoughts of suicide, thoughts of murder, thoughts of violence. I come against it in the name of Jesus. We break the chains. Lord, Lord God, you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Devil, I declare this holy ground. You can't be here. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Let's give the Lord a shout one more time. So do you have your communion? The Bible says, Jesus says, that we do this in remembrance of him. I want to share with you something very quickly as we get our bread and our juice. Do you know that the enemy believes that he owns you? You know that? If you were not saved. The enemy believes he owns you. He believes he has legal right to you. Now, how many of you know that, for instance, if you're going to consolidate your bills or something, a company will say, we'll pay all your bills off, which makes all those little contracts void, and now you owe us. That's how you consolidate a bill, right? So now all those contracts you have, that all those payments, they are completely done away with because somebody else paid your debt for you. Well, the enemy thinks he belongs to you. I mean, uh, you belong to him, I'm sorry. <laughs> and when we have communion, do you realize that it is much more than just symbolic? It is, not, it, is just, it is more than just something that we do for church. It is not something that, well, let's add 10 minutes to the service and have communion. No, 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 no. No. Come on. Jesus says, this is a new covenant. Amen. You know what that means? It means it's a new contract. It means all that debt that you pay, that you owe, I'm about to wipe that debt clean. Yeah. I'm about to rip up all the contracts, the same things he has on you, all the things, all the ownership papers he thinks he has on you. He goes, I give you a new covenant written in my blood. So guess what? When you have communion, what you are doing is saying, I don't belong to you, devil. There's a new covenant. There's a new contract. This is all brand new, and the enemy has no hold of you. So when we take communion, many of you, you're being oppressed. You're going to be set free tonight in the name of Jesus. Because what you are saying is you're saying, I belong to you, Lord. You consolidate my sins and pay for them. He says, I already did it 2,000 years ago. All you got to do is accept it. So in Luke, it says, when the hour came, he reclined at the table, and the apostles with him, and he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took the cup when he had given thanks and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves, for I tell you that from now on I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. Let's get your bread. The Bible says he took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's pray in the name of Jesus. Lord, we know that this is bread, Lord God, but this represents your body all the way back to the time of Moses, Lord God. When you told the people of Israel to eat that lamb, eat it completely and put its blood on the doorpost and you will pass over this house. We are praying, Lord God, that, that you, your blood is covered over our heart. That the enemy has to pass over and cannot touch this house because your scriptures say that I am the temple and that you dwell in your temple. Bless this bread. This is your body. We do this in remembrance of you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's eat the bread together. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Verse 20, if you have your juice. It says, likewise, the cup after they had eaten, saying, this cup that is poured out for you is a new covenant in my blood, that new contract I'm telling you about. That new contract. This 
Jews represents a new contract. Many of you that are feeling like you are attacked by the enemy, many of you that are feeling that unclean thoughts and you can't stop it from coming into your mind, many of you have dealt with santeria and you can't shake it off, many of you have dealt with witchcraft and you can't break away from it, many of you have, 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 have dived into things that you were never supposed to because of that the enemy says, oh, you open the door so I'm in here, I ain't leaving. Well, you know what? This is a new covenant, and it's about to be broken in the name of Jesus. The Lord said, this is my new covenant in my blood, new contract. New ownership's about to come. Yeah. Lord God, bless this juice, Lord God, that it represents your blood, that it enters into our body, Lord God. It is a signature of freedom. We thank you, Lord. Bless it. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's drink together. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Freedom. 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 I declare freedom in every single person that's here, Lord God. I thank you, Lord. We worship you, Lord God. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, God. Before we conclude, we're going we're gonna to finish off with this song. I want to remind you that tomorrow night... Pastor George is going to have one hour of blues and rock and roll Christian style. That's going to be here at 6 o'clock. 6, not 7, 6 o'clock. But don't forget, Sunday's coming. Sunday is coming.
to be here this Sunday. Hallelujah. God bless you, family. Thank you. 